Hello, this is chapter 26, and we're going to talk about growth. Growth is actually a really, really interesting topic when you start thinking about um, a few statistics that you see in the, um, in the world. For, for one thing, um, a large percentage of the world's population lives on less than about $2 a day income. And when we think about that, and we think about how much gains can be made from just a little bit of growth, uh, just just a, a small amount of growth can make these huge differences that, while they don't seem like much to us, are, well, actually are quite a lot. So we're going to define um, some of our goals. So we're going to define growth um, and relate it to the standard of living. So one thing that we have to remember when we talk about economic growth is that being able to produce more as an economy, which is what we think of as growth, doesn't necessarily raise the standard of living for everyone. Um, list five important sources of growth. So one of the important things we want to know is, well, where does growth come from and how do we get it? So how do we make the, say, the U.S. economy grow faster? That's one question. Another question might be, how do we make um, an underdeveloped country grow faster? Distinguish between diminishing marginal productivity from um, diminishing returns to scale. All right, we'll talk a little bit about the production function of an economy and how that works. Explain the convergence hypothesis and four reasons why it has not taken place. So we'll talk a little bit about this idea of convergence. I won't go into that now. Um, distinguish classical growth theory from new growth theory. All right, so growth in the economy's potential output. So essentially what we're talking about when we talk about growth is a shifting of this production possibilities curve so that new points, all right, these points out here are now possible. They're now feasible. So there's a couple of ways that this can happen. We know that this can happen if we have more resources. We know this can happen if we have better technology. Um, so either of those can push this um, production possibilities curve out, and that's really what we're talking about. So growth is an increase in potential output. So it's important to distinguish between short-run business cycle type fluctuations, where we'll produce more, we'll produce less. So we talk about the GDP growth rate. We may have, we may be just talking about it short-run. Okay, well it's. A, you know what around two percent in the United States not quite two percent right now um, that's not necessarily what we mean by growth what we mean by growth is the long run rate that it can stay at year in year out and be sustainable um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about growth so potential output is the highest amount of output an economy can produce from existing production processes and resources so if we hold everything constant same technology, same capital, all the resources. How much could we produce long run? Productivity is output per or unit of input. So we will talk about productivity and a productivity rise. A productivity rise might be where we can actually do more with the same amount of inputs. Productivity fall as well. We can do less with the same amount of inputs. And the long-run growth uh, focuses on how to increase potential output. So generally speaking, when we're talking about growth, we don't worry about demand. We have this idea of Say's Law, is that supply creates its own demand. In other words, in the long run, if you can build it, somebody will want it. Um, and generally that works because if nobody wants it, well, nobody stays building it for very long. The short run focuses on how to get the economy operating at its potential. So when we talk about um, economic growth in the short run, we're really more focusing on business cycle variations. So for the most part within this chapter, we're going to be talking about that long run, how do we change our potential output. All right, so you can think of, like, say, the long run trend in growth, as opposed to being above or below that trend in GDP. So, importance of growth for living standards. All right, growth in income improves average living standards. Um, because of compounding long-term growth rates can make huge differences. So, here's the thing. If, let's say we can increase a country's growth rate, long-run growth rate, by 1%. Well, 
that 1% doesn't make very much difference this year. But over the course of 100 years, it might make a ton of difference. So to illustrate this, we have a kind of a rough and ready estimate called the rule of 72. And basically what we can say is that something will, uh, if something is growing at a rate of, I don't know, 5%, then 72 divided by 5 yields the number of t years it'll take to double that income. So let's, let me do an easier one. Let's say 7% interest. Well, then in roughly 7 years, or I'm sorry, roughly 10 years, the, um, whatever that is will grow, so it will, will double. So let's say you invest $50 in a asset that yields 7%. In roughly 10 years, you'll have $100 in that asset. So, for example, if China's per capita income of $2,000 grows at 9% per year and the U.S. per capita income at 40000 grows at 1% per year, then in 40 years, China's per capita income will equal the U.S. and in nine more years, it will be significantly higher than the U.S., assuming that the growth rates stay the same, which they probably won't. And actually, they haven't stayed the same. But you can see this by looking at the difference between the growth rate of China and the growth rate of U.S., which is about 8%. So that means China's growing at about 8% faster than the U.S. And we can see how many years does it take for the um, um, China to catch up. Well, you take 72 divided by 8, and that tells you how long it takes to double, and you just go from there. I'm not going to spend a long time on the rule of 72 because it's really just an approximation, and it's just a way to kind of give you an idea of how important, you know, just 1% extra growth can be. Okay, market specializations and growth. One of the most important things that you can have within an economy is his ability to specialize. So, for example, you have some people who are really, really good at building things. If they can specialize at building things, then they're going to be a whole lot better at it than somebody else who's not very good at building things, but, man, are they really good at um, sewing. All right, you got someone who's good at sewing, someone who's good at building, someone who is good at um, figuring out financial matters, someone who's good at... we got all these different things that we're good at, right? If you can specialize, you can get really good at that thing that you're good at and not have to be good at everything. Um, this can let, let us divide the labor up such that each person is doing what they're best at and, as a result, are more productive. So, specialization is concentration of individuals on certain aspects of production. Division of labor is splitting up the task um, to allow specialization of production. In other words, we divide labor up into who is best at doing what they do, and because of that, that specialization, they can become more productive. Ah, markets may seem unfair because they the effect that they have on distribution of income. Well, actually, yeah, that's true. So we have these markets where you have one person who's really, really good at doing what they do. But what they do happens to be um, a fairly low-paid um, job, um, as opposed to someone who's, you know, just mediocre at what they do. Um, say they're a professional athlete, but they're not like an all-star professional athlete. They're just good enough, right? Um, so, okay, well, you know, they're just good enough, but they still they get paid a whole lot more than this really, really, really good person at whatever it is they do, right? Um, well, that may not be fair, but even though this growth isn't distributed evenly, it generally raises income of all. So, here's the thing. Just because we have economic growth doesn't mean we'll raise everyone's standard of living. However, without economic growth, it's going to be very difficult to raise anybody's standard of living without lowering someone else's. All right. And while this market system does seem somewhat unfair, it also gives incentive to go into those industries, into those jobs that are most needed. 
So cost of goods and hours work. This is kind of an interesting statistic. This is an interesting map I, or graph. I like this one. All right, look at 1919 versus 2009. All right, I don't know why we're picking 1919 and 2009. 2009 is probably about as close, pretty close to the publication date of this um, um, book. And I don't know why 1919. But if we look at it, we see... Um, in terms of hours work, so this is, say, the average hourly wage, how much it would have taken. So for a half gallon of milk in 1919, we're talking close to 40 hours, so close to working a week to get a, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is in minutes worked, I'm sorry. So just a little, about 40 hours, or 40 minutes. All right, a pound of beef, all right, we're talking, you know, what, about 30 minutes, well, 35 minutes. Dozen eggs, almost almost two hours. A chicken. This is kind of interesting. Chicken, three pound chicken, over two, almost three hours, right? Um, we flip that around and we look at today. All right. All of these are a quarter or half to a quarter of the time it took um, before in order to earn enough money in order to buy um, this stuff. Well, this, in an essence, is an example of growth because of technological innovation, because of um, in increased resources, and because of increased productivity. We're able to produce all of these things for much, much less in terms of the actual number of hours or number of minutes you have to work in order to earn them. So, We've talked about per capita before, and per capita just means per person, all right? And we realize that we need to adjust um, total economic output by population. For example, who should have bigger GDP, the U.S. or Iceland? Well, the United States had better have bigger GDP than Iceland because the United States has a lot more people. Who should have a bigger GDP, United States or China? Well, right now the United States does, but actually China should have a bigger GDP than we do um, by quite a bit because they've got a ton more people to feed. So we usually talk about term in th this in terms of per capita output. So per capita output is total output divided by the population. All right, per capita growth means the country is producing more goods and services per person. So what that means is we're producing m enough more stuff so that on average every person has more stuff. So the per capita growth rate is going to equal and and this is essentially the way to think about growth rates. Um, the growth rate of a product is the sum of the growth rates. Alright and in this case it's a divided so it's minus. So if I want to know what the per capita growth rate is I need to know what the growth rate and output is and I subtract off the growth rate in the population. Why? Because per capita growth, all right, per capita output is equal to the um, total output divided by the population, right? It says right here. So grow, if I want to know the growth rate in per capita output or per capita growth, I need to know the growth rate of output. And instead of minus, because it's, or instead of divided, because it's a growth rate, I subtract the growth rate of the population. All right, some suggest that median income is a better measure because it takes into account how income is distributed. Yes and no. Here, here's the thing. If you have a, a, you have a data that's distributed and there's a lot of skew, for example, let's say we have 15 people in a room and we ask them what they're, all what their income is and we take the average of that income. All right, and then we bring in Bill Gates or um, any other person who makes lots and lots and lots of income, right? Bring them into the room, and then we do the average again. Well, the median is going to be far less affected by um, the, incre the addition of that outlier than the average will be. Um, so some say it's a better measure of central tendency in this case. Hmm, possibly it's less subject to skew. Um, but generally we still just use average because it's easier. All right, if you want some further reading, I highly recommend this, Economic Growth by Paul Romer. 